Okay, so we just went over how to uh, work a crime scene, and maybe you've watched the uh, basic uh, lecture, my video lecture yet, maybe not. But now we're going to talk about preserving and rearing insects once you uh, get them at a crime scene. So this is how you actually handle your insect evidence. So, in, the insects collected at the scene need to either be preserved or placed for rearing, one or the other. Okay, you need a certain sample that are preserved. You want to know exactly what they looked like at the crime scene. And then, if you have some live ones, you want to be able to wear those out at a standard temperature to get some more information. So you want to preserve the insects at the scene, hopefully, or as close as possible to make sure you have a good idea as to how old the maggots were when the body was found. This way, if you need to review your case in the future, if you need to hand it off to another entomologist, whatever, you have an exact picture of what those maggots looked like. All right, to do that, you need to go through two steps. Uh, a two-step process to of boiling the maggots and then placing them in ethanol, so ethyl alcohol. First up, boiling. Boiling soft-bodied insects breaks down the waxy cuticle on the outside of their body. So all insects have a waxy outer surface of their body, kind of like the oil we have on our skin. And what this does is it helps them uh, preserve water keep water in their body. They are soft-bodied. It helps uh, keep bacteria and other diseases out. So it, it helps them live, basically. You have to get through that waxy cuticle. That waxy layer will keep the preservation fluid from entering into the tissues. And the tissues will end up rotting, even if they are in alcohol. So I've seen this a million times. You get this vial of maggots, and it looks beautiful. You get in there, and you see that the outside is kind of fine, but the inside is just mush and gross, and they fall apart, and it's horrible. Oh, oh man. And there's a few tricks you could try to do to uh, fix those, but for the most part, oh, it's the worst. All right. Now, in order to break down this waxy tissue, you need to use hot water. This is why we call it the boiling method. And you don't really need uh, fully ro a roiling, a roiling, a rolling boil of water. You just need to make it hot enough so it's just about boiling. Usually, a couple minutes in the microwave will work. Think about a good hot tea or hot coffee, about that temperature. What I usually do is I got my teapot that I throw on the stove. For, until it gets a good rolling boil, and then I dump that into a thermos. And by the time I get to the scene, it's cooled down just a little bit. So it's not still fully boiling, but it's nice and hot, and it's good to go. And it'll stay like that for a good long time. Like I said, I use this uh, uh, special thermos. It's a Starbucks thermos, and uh, used to be my husband's. Then I started using it for this, and now he doesn't want it back, and I don't understand why. <laughs> So the other, uh, it's a good thermos. The other day I was, uh, um, I had hot water in that thermos, you know, I had an, and I, I sterilize it each time I, I use it at a scene. And I was out and about, I had hot water in the thermos for one reason or another, and I had a tea bag, so I made tea in the little cup top thing, and then realized, oh, I'm drinking tea out of my maggot thermos. Awesome? Awesome. All right. Anyhow, so you need this hot water. Then all you need to do is you drop live maggots into the water. That's it. Living, you don't need to wash them, you just drop them into the water. If the water is hot enough, the maggots will die instantly. And they will extend out to their full length. They won't curl up, they won't do anything, they'll just die and extend. Basically, you're cooking their their tissue. So you don't need to leave them in the water very long. Just a few seconds, enough time for them to die. So this cooks their tissues, it fixes their tissues, it will uh, make them sort of hard and opaque, and it'll uh, keep anything from digesting. It's beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful way. It also breaks down that waxy cuticle. Once you've been boiled, they've been boiled, you place them in a vial full of 70 or 80% ethanol. Now, you want to use ethanol. Isopropyl alcohol, so just rubbing alcohol, will cause discoloration and desiccation of the maggot. I've worked many a case where you get these maggots, and they're all black and gross, and you think they've been boiled, they've been put in alcohol. What's the problem? Oh, it's isopropyl. Once I even got got bugs that were preserved in that wintergreen flavored isopropyl. That was weird. They smells nice, I suppose. Does not do good for uh for uh, preserving them, but they smelled pretty. So there was that. All right. 
Now, you want to keep it at the 70 to 80 percent ethanol because anything higher, you get up to the 95 percent ethanol, and that causes the tissues to turn very brittle. It's harder to work with a maggot with those brittle, brittle tissues. Of course, if you want to keep these maggots for DNA, you have to put it in that 95 percent ethanol at the minus 80. So you want to decide what you're using these maggots for. And it is possible to use the maggots that are in 95% um, ethanol. However, it's, they just tend to break a little easier. So, you know, just sort of keep that in mind. If you only have 95%, that's fine. They'll just probably break in half once or twice. All right. Once you have everything boiled in alcohol, all that sort of stuff, you want to label your evidence. Never, never, never leave more than one vial unlabeled at a time. Because every time, oh, this happens all the time. You'll go, okay, I know what these maggots are. They're from the head, and you set them aside. I know what these are. They're from the foot. I know what these are. You get two, three vials out there. You forget which is which, and then everything's screwed up. So the second you get your maggots into a vial, you're going to label them twice. First and foremost, you use indelible ink, so those micron pens, or pencil to write on the labels. Never use a Sharpie. Sharpies are great for most things, but they will dissolve in ethanol. So indelible ink or a pencil, and you write on these labels, something that won't dissolve in alcohol, and you're going to write just like this label right here shows. So this is basically what you need. You need your geographical location, so Bryan, Texas, where I'm at. The date and the hour of collection, so what is the date today? The uh, um, November 6th, 2012, at 5 p.m., or in you know, 1,700 hours. Uh, the case number. This can be your case number, this can be the general case number, whatever way you're, you're um, organizing this. Uh, the location on the body, from the head, from the anus, from wounds, and then the name of the collector. So in this case, it would be A. Brundage. Okay, so all of those things go on this label, and this label goes inside the vial itself. Then you get a sticky label on the outside. Okay, so this label you can see here, these are sticky labels on the outside of the vials. You can see over here, you got some labels on the inside. So. Label on the inside, label on the outside. This way, in case something happens, you have everything labeled twice. Then every time you bring out the evidence in these vials, you can see there's maggots in here, there's some pupa in here. What I do is I always take out those inner labels and I set them right above those maggots. So if I'm doing uh, photographs of the evidence, if I'm looking at them under the microscope, that label is always with the evidence. And as soon as the evidence goes back in that vial, I put the label back in that vial. They're always together. However, if for some reason that inner label disintegrates, it rips, you just can't read it, it you don't use indelible ink, whatever happens, you still have that outer label to rely on. That's, th that is just invaluable. Okay. Um, both labels should say exactly the same thing. So the inner label and the outer label need to be um, labeled this exact way. All right. Now, rearing. Once you have those live maggots, you're going to rear them out, and you're going to, pl uh, you're going to rear them out so that you can uh, do an identification of the adults, or there are some ways where, let's say you've got maggots that are in the third instar, but the third instar, as many of you know, you've looked at those life tables. It can last anywhere from five days to weeks, right? So if I were just to go on a third instar maggot, my time of colonization would be anywhere from five days to three weeks, say. Uh, that's a really big time of colonization interval. If I, What I could do is I could put these maggots at a uh, in a temperature chamber, watch how long it takes them to get to their adult stage, and then figure out using my basic... Um, my basic formula that I'll teach you in a little bit, exactly how long they were in that uh, third instar. So let's say they were in that at my stable temperature for two weeks, then I know of their three-week life cycle, they were probably one week into that third instar. All right. So that will just sort of refine my time of colonization a little bit better. But what you do immediately is you put your maggots on some sort of food source. Uh, fresh liver works well. That's what's going on over here. I've got a bunch of maggots on this fresh liver in a little tin foil container that I made. Um, however, liver can be really messy, can be hard to transport. You'll have to keep it frozen and then it thaws and blood goes everywhere, blah. 
Um, what I use primarily for long-term storage or just so that my kit is ready to go is I use cat food. So cat food has all the nutrients maggots need. It's better than tuna because it's got all these, it's fortified with vitamins, has some extra stuff in there, whatever. Um, and it usually comes in a pop top. So I keep three or four cans of cat food in my kit. This way, if I'm called out in the middle of the night, if I need to go, at, go to a scene really quickly, I know I have food for living maggots in there. The only problem with this is, uh, Cat food that is infested with maggots smells worse than anything, almost anything. Rotting spleen smells really worse than anything I've ever smelled. But rotting cat food is right up there. And that is super gross. You know, there. So we normally use Fancy Feast just because they're, or I do, just because they're, it's really a small can, stuff like that. But for a while there, there was a uh, um, sort of a generic cat food that, that our lab was using. It was, came in nice small cans, very compact, just enough to get to the lab and we could transfer to the liver, whatever. And everything was working fine until one day we started putting maggots on these cans that we had just bought and all the maggots died. It was really weird. We had no idea what was going on. So our boss called the uh, company and asked, um, hey, did you change your cat food formula? And they freaked out. How did you know that? This is a trade secret. Uh, what's going on? Do you know things? And he had to say, no, it's just because our maggots started dying. They weren't dying before. Could you change it back? They wouldn't change it back. Whatever. We changed to Fancy Feast. A little more expensive, but lasts a long time. It doesn't kill the maggots. For future reference. Anyhow, whatever you put your maggots on, you take them back to your lab. You return to your lab, your workroom, whatever, and you want to place your liver or your foil or your cat food or, or whatever you have in a secondary container with sand. Okay, so this right here, this is just a Tupperware container I have. You can see that there's um, some liver down here. At the bottom, there is sand. Um, here at the top, that's also a, a larger t a Tupperware container I have with some maggots in it uh, on liver and sand in there. That sand allows for a pupation medium. So once the maggots have finished feeding on that liver, they will leave that the liver, go burrow into the sand, and pupate. All right. So you put all of this into a temperature chamber. Up at the top here, this is my walk-in chamber. I keep this at uh, about 30 degrees Celsius, so nice and warm. Things, And it's a standard temperature. I've got this right here is my hobo unit. That will uh, tell me make sure that I keep a, a static temperature in there. All of these cages are all fly rearing cages. So in there I've got adult flies going on here. Here's some maggot rearing. I've got some maggot rearing going on up here. These are little cups with individual uh, flies in there. I'm running some experiments in here. You can see my preservative fluids over here. This is the stool I sit on while I'm counting things and doing whatnot. All right, so it's a, it's a nice big walk-in chamber. You don't necessarily need something this big. There are stand-up chambers you can use. Um, I've even uh, sort of hacked a, a little dorm fridge into a good rearing chamber. Anything that you can keep that at a stable temperature, then you can use as a rearing chamber, and that works beautifully. 